but when it comes to armies they do not bear comparison, and this springs entirely from the insufficiency of the leaders, since those who are capable are not obedient, and each one seems to himself. Hence it is that for so long a time, and during so much fighting in the past twenty years, whenever there has been an army wholly Italian, it has always given a poor account of itself. If, therefore, your illustrious house wishes to follow these remarkable men who have redeemed their country, it is necessary before all things, as a true foundation for and although singly they are good, altogether they will be much better when they find themselves commanded by their prince, honored by him, and maintained at his expense. Therefore it is necessary to be prepared with such arms, so that you can be defended against foreigners by Italian valor. And although Swiss and Spanish infantry may be considered very formidable, nevertheless there is a defect in both, by reason of which a third order would not only be able to oppose them, but might be relied for the Spaniards cannot resist cavalry, and the Switzers are afraid of infantry whenever they encounter them in close combat. Owing to this, as has been and may again be seen, the Spaniards are unable to resist French cavalry, and the Switzers are overthrown by Spanish infantry. And although a complete proof of this latter cannot be shown, nevertheless there was some evidence of it at the Battle of Ravenna, when the Spanish infantry were confronted by German battalions, who fought. It is possible, therefore, knowing the defects of both these infantries, to invent a new one, which will resist cavalry and not be afraid of infantry. This need not, and these are the kind of improvements which confer reputation and power upon a new prince. This opportunity, therefore, ought not to be allowed to pass for letting Italy at last see her liberator appear nor can one express the love with which he would be received in all those provinces which have suffered so much from these foreign scorings, with what thirst for revenge, with what stubborn faith, what door would be closed to him, who would refuse obedience to him, what envy would hinder him, what Italian would refuse him homage. To all of us this barbarous demand, let, therefore, your illustrious house take up this charge with that courage and hope with which all just enterprises are undertaken, so that under its standard our native country virtue against fury shall advance the fight, and it I've come but soon shall put to flight. For the old Roman valor is not dead, nor in the Italian's breasts extinguished. Edward Dacre, 1640 Description of the methods adopted by the Duke Valentino when murdering Vitello Zovatelli a livrato di fermo, the signor Pagolo, and the duke di Gravina Orsini by Niccolo. These matters coming to the knowledge of the Vitelli and Orsini and their following, it appeared to them that the duke would become too powerful, and it was feared that, having seized Bologna, he would seek. Upon this a meeting was called at Magin in the district of Perugia, to which came the cardinal Pagolo, and the duke di Gravina Orsini, Vitello Zovitelli, a livrato da fermo. Here were discussed the power and courage of the duke, and the necessity of curbing his ambitions, which might otherwise bring danger to the rest of being ruined. And they decided not to abandon the bent of Agli, but to strive to win over the Florentines. And they sent their men to one place and another, promising to one party assistance, and to another. This meeting was at once reported throughout all Italy, and those who were discontented under the duke, among whom were the people of Urbano, took hope of effecting a revolution. Thus it arose that, men's minds being thus unsettled, it was decided by certain men of Urbano to seize the fortress of San Leo, which was held for the duke, and which they captured by the fire. The Castellan was fortifying the rock and causing timber to be taken there. So the conspirators watched, and when certain beams which were being carried to the rock were upon the bridge, Upon this capture being effected, the whole state rebelled and recalled the old duke, being encouraged in this, not so much by the capture of the fort, as by the diet at Magen. Those who heard of the rebellion at Urbano thought they would not lose the opportunity, and at once assembled their men so as to take any town should any remain in the hands of the duke in that state. But the Florentines, from hatred for sundry reasons of the Vitelli and Orsini, not only would not ollie themselves, but sent Niccolo Machiavelli, 
their secretary to offer shelter and dis the duke was found full of fear at amola because against everybody's expectation his soldiers had at once gone over to the enemy and he found himself disarmed and war at his door but recovering courage from the offers of the florentines he decided to temporize before fighting with the few soldiers that remained to him and to negotiate for a reconciliation this latter he obtained in two ways by sending to the king of france for men and by enlisting men at arms and others whom he turned into cavalry of a sort to all he gave money notwithstanding this his enemies drew near to him and approached fossombron where they encountered some men of the duke and with the aid of the orsini and when this happened the duke resolved at once to see if he could not close the trouble with offers of reconciliation and being a most perfect dissembler he did not fail in any practices to make and the duke succeeded so well in this that they sent signor pagolo to him to negotiate for a reconciliation and they brought their army to a standstill but the duke did not stop his preparations and took every care to provide himself with cavalry and infantry and that such preparations might not be apparent to the others he sent his troops in the meanwhile there came also to him five hundred french lancers and although he found himself sufficiently strong to take vengeance on his enemies in open war he considered that it would and that this might be effected the duke concluded a peace with them in which he confirmed their former covenants he gave them four thousand ducats at once he promised not to injure the bentevac on the other hand they promised to restore to him the duchy of urbino and other places seized by them to serve him in all his expeditions and not to make war against or ally themselves with this reconciliation being completed guido ubaldo the duke of urbino again fled to venice having first destroyed all the fortresses in his state but the duke valentino having completed this convention and dispersed his men throughout the romagna set out for amola have the end of november together with his french men at arm to this the duke replied that he did not wish to enter into war with tuscany and thus become hostile to the florentines but that he was very willing to proceed against senegalia it happened that not long afterwards the town surrendered but the fortress would not yield to them because the castellan would not give it up to any one but the duke in person therefore they exhorted him to come this appeared a good opportunity to the duke as being invited by them and not going of his own will he would awaken no suspicions and the more to reassure them he allowed all the french men at arms who were with him in lombardy to depart except the hundred lancers under munz di candales his brother-in-law he left cesina about the middle of december and went to fano and with the utmost cunning and cleverness he persuaded the vitelli and orsini to wait for him at senegalia pointing but Vitellozzo remained very stubborn, for the death of his brother warned him that he should not offend a prince and afterwards trust him. Nevertheless, persuaded by Pagolo Orsini, who, upon this the duke, before his departure from Fano, which was to be on 30 December 1502, communicated his designs to eight of his most trusted followers. The duke afterwards ordered all his horsemen and infantry of which there were more than two thousand cavalry and ten thousand footmen to assemble by daybreak at the mataro a river he found himself therefore on the last day of december at the mataro with his men and having sent a cavalcade of about two hundred horsemen before him he then moved forward the infantry fano and sinigalia are two cities of la marca situated on the shore of the adriatic sea fifteen miles distant from each other so that he who goes towards Senegalia has the mountain. The city of Senegalia is distant from the foot of the mountains a little more than a bow shot, and from the shore about a mile. On the side opposite to the city runs a little river which baths that part of the walls looking towards Fano, facing the high road. Thus he who draws near to Senegalia comes for a good space by road along the mountains, and reaches the river which passes by Senegalia if he turns to his left hand along the bank of it and goes for the distance of a bow shot he arrives at a bridge which crosses the river he is then almost abreast of the gate that leads 
Before this gate there stands a collection of houses with a square to which the bank of the river forms one side. The Vitelli and Orsini, having received orders to wait for the Duke, and to honor him in person, sent away their men to several castles distant from Senegalia about six miles, so that matters having been thus arranged, the Duke Valentino left for Senegalia, and when the leaders of the cavalry reached the bridge they did not pass over, but having opened it, one portion wheeled to Vitellazzo, Pagolo, and the Duke di Gravina on mules, accompanied by a few horsemen, went towards the Duke. Vitellozzo, unarmed and wearing a cape, and it is said that when he parted from his men before setting out for Senegalia to meet the Duke, he acted as if it were his last parting from them. He recommended his house and its fortunes to his captains, and advised his nephews that it was not the fortune of their house, but the virtues of their fathers that should be kept in mind. These three, therefore, came before the duke and saluted him respectfully, and were received by him with good will. They were at once placed between those who were commissioned to look at, but the duke noticing that Oliverato, who had remained with his band in Senegalia, was missing for Oliverato was waiting in the square before his quarters near the river, keeping his men in order Therefore Don Michael rode off and joined Oliverato, telling him that it was not right to keep his men out of their quarters, because these might be taken up by the men of the Duke. And he advised, and Oliverato, having taken this advice, came before the Duke, who, when he saw him, called to him, and Oliverato, having made his obeisance, joined the other. So the whole party entered Senegalia, dismounted at the Duke's quarters, and went with him into a secret chamber, where the duke made them prisoners. Where then mounted those of Oliverato, being at hand, were quickly settled, but those of the Orsini and Vitelli, being at a distance, and having a presentiment of the destruction of their mass, but the duke's soldiers, not being content with having pillaged the men of Oliverato, began to sack Senegalia, and if the duke had not repressed this outrage by killing some of them, they would have night having come and the tumult being silenced. The duke prepared to kill Vitellazzo and Liverato. He led them into a room and caused them to be strangled. Neither of them used words in keeping with their past lives. Vitellazzo prayed that he might ask of the pope full pardon for his sins. Oliverato cringed and laid the blame for all in Pagolo and the Duke di Gravina Orsini were kept alive until the Duke heard from Rome that the Pope had taken the Cardinal Orsino, the Archbishop of Florence, and Messer Jacopo de Santa Croce. After which news, on 18th January 1502, in the castle of Pieve, they also were strangled in the same way. The Life of Castruxio Castricani of Lucca, written by Niccolo Machiavelli and sent to his friends Zenobi Buendelmonti, and Luigi Alamanni Castruxu Castricani 1280. They have either been exposed to the mercy of wild beasts, or they have had so mean a parentage that in shame they have given themselves out to be sons of Jove or of some other deity. It would be wearisome to relate who these persons may have been because they are well known to everybody, and, as such tales would not be particularly edifying to those who read them, they are a I believe that these lowly beginnings of great men occur because fortune is desirous of showing to the world that such men owe much to her and little to wisdom, because she begins to show her hand when wisdom can. Castruxio Castricani of Lucca was one of those men who did great deeds, if he is measured by the times in which he lived and the city in which he was born. But, like many others, he was. It appeared to be desirable to recall his memory because I have discerned in him such indications of valor and fortune as should make him a great exemplar to men. I think also that I ought to call your attention to his actions, because you of all men I know delight most in noble deeds. The family of Castricani was formerly numbered among the noble families of Lucca, but in the days of which I speak it had somewhat fallen in estate, as so often happens in this world. To this family was born a son Antonio, who became a priest of the order of San Michael of Lucca, and for this reason was honored with the title of Messer Antonio. He had an only sister, who had been married to Buonacorso Sanami, but Buonacorso dying she became a widow, 
and not wishing to marry again went to live with her brother. Messer Antonio had a vineyard behind the house where he resided, and as it was bounded on all sides by gardens, any person could have access to it without difficulty. One morning, shortly after sunrise, Madonna Dianaraz, the sister of Messer Antonio, was called, had occasion to go into the vineyard as usual to gather herbs for seasoning the dinner, whereupon she went towards it, and saw the hands and face of a baby who was lying enveloped in the leaves and who seemed to be crying for its mother, partly wondering and partly fearing, yet full of compassion. She lifted it up and carried it to the house, where she washed it and clothed it with clean linen as is customary, and showed it to him. When he heard what had happened, and saw the child, he was not less surprised or compassionate than his sister. They discussed between themselves what should be done, and seeing that he was priest and that she had no children, they finally determined to bring it up. They had a nurse for it, and it was reared and loved as if it were their own child. They baptized it, and gave it the name of Kestruxu after their father. As the years passed, Kestruxu grew very handsome, and gave evidence of wit and discretion, and learnt with a quickness beyond his years those lessons which Messer Antonio imparted to him. Messer Antonio intended to make a priest of him, and in time would have inducted him into his canonry and other benefices, and all his instruction was given with this object. But Antonio as soon as Castruxio reached the age of fourteen, he began to take less notice of the chiding of Messer Antonio and Madonna Dianora, and no longer to fear them. He left off reading Ecclesia. In all exercises he far excelled his companions in courage and bodily strength, and if at any time he did turn to books, only those pleased him which told of wars and the mighty deeds of men. Messer Antonio beheld all this with vexation and sorrow. There lived in the city of Lucca a gentleman of the Guinegy family, named Messer Francisco, whose profession was arms and who in riches, bodily strength, and valor excelled all other. He had often fought under the command of the Visconti of Milan, and as a Ghibelline was the valued leader of that party in Lucca. This gentleman resided in Lucca, and was accustomed to assemble with others most mornings and evenings under the balcony of the Podesta which is at the top of the square of San Michiel. Noticing that Castruxio far excelled the other boys, and that he appeared to exercise a royal authority over them, and that they loved and obeyed him, Messer Francisco became greatly desirous. Being informed of the circumstances of the bringing up of Castruxio, he felt a greater desire to have him near to him. Therefore he called him one day and asked him whether he would more willingly live in the house of a gentleman, where he would learn to ride horses and use arms, or in the house of a priest, where he would... Messer Francisco could see that it pleased Castruxio greatly to hear horses and arms spoken of, even though he stood silent, blushing modestly, but being encouraged by Messer Francisco. This reply delighted Messer Francisco, and in a very short time he obtained the consent of Messer Antonio, who was driven to yield by his knowledge of the nature of the lad. And the fe thus Castruxio passed from the house of Messer Antonio the priest to the house of Messer Francisco Guinigi the soldier, and it was astonishing to find that in a very short time he manifested all. In the first place he became an accomplished horseman, and could manage with ease the most fiery charger, and in all justs and tournaments, although still a youth, he was observed beyond all. But what enhanced so much the charm of these accomplishments? was the delightful modesty which enabled him to avoid offence in either act or word to others, for he was deferential to the great man. These gifts made him beloved, not only by all the Guinegy family, but by all Lucca. When Castruxio had reached his eighteenth year, the Ghibellines were driven from Pavia by the Guelphs, and Messer Francisco was sent by the Visconti to assist the Ghibellines, and with him went Castruxio. Castruxio gave ample proof of his prudence and courage in this expedition, acquiring greater reputation than any other captain, and his name and fame were known not only in Pavia, but Castruxio, having returned to Lucca in far higher estimation than he left it, did not omit to use all the means in his power to gain as many friends as he could, neglecting none of those arts which are necessary. About this time Messer Francisco died, leaving a son thirteen years of age named Pagallo, 
and having appointed Castruxo to be his son's tutor and administrator of his estate. Before he died, Francisco called Castruxo to him and prayed him to show Pagolo that goodwill which he, Francisco, had always shown to him, and to render to the son the gratitude which, upon the death of Francisco, Castruxo became the governor and tutor of Pagolo, which increased enormously his power and position, and created a certain amount of envy against him. And among these, the leading man was Georgia Degli Apaisi, the head of the Guelph party. This man hoped after the death of Messer Francisco to become the chief man in Lucca, but it seemed to him that Castruxio, with the great abilities which he already showed, and holding the position of Castruxio at first treated this with scorn, but afterwards he grew alarmed, thinking that Messer Giorgio might be able to bring him into disgrace with the deputy of King Ruberto of Naples. The lord of Pisa at that time was a gumption of the Fagula of Arezzo, who being in the first place elected their captain afterwards became their lord. There resided in Paris some exiled Gabellines from Lucca, with whom Castruxio held communications with the object of effecting their restoration by the help of Aguction. Castruxio also brought into his plans friends from Lucca who would not endure the authority of the Apaisi. Having fixed upon a plan to be followed, Castruxio cautiously fortified the tower of the Mesta, filling it with supplies and munitions of war, in order that it might stand a siege for a when the night came which had been agreed upon with Aguction, who had occupied the plain between the mountains and Pisa with many men, the signal was given, and without being observed Aguction approached the gate. Castruxio raised a great uproar within the city, calling the people to arms and forcing open the gate from his side. Aguction entered with his men, poured through the town, and killed Messer Giorgio with all his family and many of his friends and supporters. The governor was driven out, and the government reformed according to the wishes of Aguction, to the detriment of the city, because it was found that more than one hundred families were exiled at that time. Of those who fled, part went to Florence and part to Pistoia, which city was the headquarters of the Guelph party, and for this reason it became most hostile to Aguction and the Lucchis. As it now appeared to the Florentines and others of the Guelph party that the Ghibellines absorbed too much power in Tuscany, they determined to restore the exiled Guelphs to Lucca. They assembled a large army in the Val di Nivole and seized Montecatini. From thence they marched to Monte Carlo in order to secure the free passage into Lucca. Upon this, Aguction assembled his Pizin and Lucci's forces, and with a number of German cavalry which he drew out of Lombardy, he moved against the quarters of the Florentines, who upon Aguction now took up a position near to Monte Carlo and within about two miles of the enemy, and slight skirmishes between the horse of both parties were of daily occurrence. Owing to the illness of Aguction, the Pisans and Lucchis delayed coming to battle with the enemy. Aguction, finding himself growing worse, went to Monte Carlo to be cured, and left the command of the army in the hands of Castruxio. This change brought about the ruin of the Guelphs, who, thinking that the hostile army, having lost its captain, had lost its head, grew overconfident. Castruxio observed this, and allowed some days to pass in order to encourage this belief. He also showed signs of fear, and did not allow any of the munitions of the camp to be. On the other side, the Guelphs grew more insolent the more they saw these evidences of fear, and every day they drew out in the order of battle in front of the army of Castruxio. Presently, deeming that the enemy was sufficiently emboldened, and having mastered their tactics, he decided to join battle with them. First he spoke a few words of encouragement to his soldiers, and pointed out to them the certainty of victory if they would but obey his commands. Castruxo had noticed how the enemy had placed all his best troops in the center of the line of battle, and his less reliable men on the wings of the army, whereupon he did exactly the opposite. Observing this order of battle, he drew out of his lines and quickly came in sight of the hostile army, who, as usual, had come in their insolence to defy him. He then commanded his center squadrons to march slowly, whilst he moved rapidly forward those on the wings. Thus, when they came into contact with the enemy, only the wings of the two armies became engaged, 
whilst the centre battalions remained out of action, for these two portions of the line. By this expedient the more valiant part of Kastruxu's men were opposed to the weaker part of the enemy's troops, and the most efficient men of the enemy were disengaged, and thus the Florentines were unable. So, without much difficulty, Castruccio put the enemy to flight on both flanks, and the center battalions took to flight when they found themselves exposed to attack. Without the defeat was complete, and the loss in men very heavy, there being more than 10,000 men killed with many officers and knights of the Guelf party in Tuscany, and also many princes who had come. On the part of Castruccio the loss did not amount to more than 300 men, among whom was Francisco, the son of Aguxion, who, being young and rash, was killed in the first onset. This victory so greatly increased the reputation of Castruxu that Aguxion conceived some jealousy and suspicion of him, because it appeared to Aguxion that this victory had given him no increase of power. Being of this mind, he only waited for an opportunity to give effect to it. This occurred on the death of Pier Agnolo Michele, a man of great repute and abilities in Lucca, the murderer of whom fled to the house of Castruxio for refuge. On the sergeants of the captain going to arrest the murderer, they were driven off by Castruxio, and the murderer escaped. This affair coming to the knowledge of Aguxion, who was then at Pisa, it appeared to him a proper opportunity to punish Castruxio. He therefore sent for his son Neri, who was the governor of Lucca, and commissioned him to take Castruxio prisoner at a banquet and put him to death. Castruxio, fearing no evil, went to the governor in a friendly way, was entertained at supper, and then thrown into prison. But Neri, fearing to put him to death lest the people should be incensed, kept him alive, in order to hear further from his father concerning his intentions. Agushin cursed the hesitation and cowardice of his son, and at once set out from Pisa to Lucca with four hundred horsemen to finish the business in his own way but he had not yet reached the baths. Before Aguxion reached Lucca he heard of the occurrences at Pisa, but it did not appear wise to him to turn back, lest the Lucchis with the example of Pisa before them should close their gates against him. But the Lucchis, having heard of what had happened at Pisa, availed themselves of this opportunity to demand the liberation of Castruxio, notwithstanding that Aguxion had arrived in their They first began to speak of it in private circles, afterwards openly in the squares and streets. Then they raised a tumult, and with arms in their hands went to Aguxion and demanded Aguxion, fearing that worse might happen, released him from prison, whereupon Castruxu gathered his friends around him, and with the help of the people attacked Aguxion, who, finding he had no resource but in flight, rode away with his but Castruxio from being a prisoner became almost a prince in Lucca, and he carried himself so discreetly with his friends and the people that they appointed him captain of their army for one year. Having obtained this, and wishing to gain renown in war, he planned the recovery of the many towns which had rebelled after the departure of Aguxion, and with the help of the Pisans, with whom he... To capture this place he constructed a fort against it, which is called today Zirezanello, in the course of two months, Castruxio captured the town. With the reputation gained at that siege, he rapidly seized Massa, Carora, and Lavenza, and in a short time had overrun the whole of Lunigiana. In order to close the pass which leads from Lombardy to Lunigiana, he besieged Pontremoli and wrested it from the hands of Messer Anastasio Pallavicini, who was the lord of it. After this victory, he returned to Lucca and was welcomed by the whole people. And now Castruxu, deeming it imprudent any longer to defer making himself a prince, got himself created the lord of Lucca by the help of Pazno del Pago, Puxinello del Portico, at this time Frederick of Bavaria, the king of the Romans, came into Italy to assume the imperial crown, and Castruxu, in order that he might make friends with him, met him. Castruxu had left as his deputy in Lucca, Pagolo Ginigi, who was held in high estimation because of the people's love for the memory of his father. Castruxio was received in great honor by Frederick, and many privileges were conferred upon him, and he was appointed the emperor's lieutenant in Tuscany. 
At this time the Pisans were in great fear of Gado della Gerardisca, whom they had driven out of Pisa, and they had recourse for assistance to Frederick. 